Coney Island's Winter Dreams, The Lighthouse Project, New York City. A project of Lancelot Hamelin and Duncan Evanieu. If you want, for you, I could be nothing or just a trace. Not yet. 1928, André Breton. He wandered throughout the cities of our time in quest of a dream. He listened to people telling him their dreams. He noted that the frontiers between cities did not exist. The dreams opened, created unexpected pathways between countries while the dreamers were living in different cities. Episode four, the Coney Island winter dream. We squat upon the beach of love, among the beached mermaids, with their brewing babies and bald husbands and homemade wooden animals with ice cream spoons for feet, which cannot walk or love except to eat. A Coney Island of the Mind, Lawrence Ferlinghetti. I am walking with the 16th Dreamer on Mermaid Street, Coney Island looking for dreamers. And she is telling me that a great-great-grandmother lived in this area, having emigrated from Russia. Sixteenth dreamer, named Gillian, work intern of the cultural services of the French Embassy and editor at the Brooklyn Rail. City of birth, San Francisco, grew up in Brooklyn, mother and father, both lawyers, City where you're living, between Manhattan and Brooklyn. City where you're working. Mother tongue, English, religion, Jewish. Day of the dream, summer 2017. My mother's side of the family has roots in Brooklyn. I've heard stories about visiting my mom's bubble gussy in Brighton Beach. In the Jewish tradition, you pass along the first letter of a recently passed relative to the next generation. I share my G with Gussie. Gussie lived on West 5th Street near Lincoln High School and would take my mother and her husband, cousin John to the boardwalk for the fireworks at 84 years of age. This past summer, I had a surreal dream while staying on the east end of Long Island with my family. I dreamt about our family's dog, Ollie a loving, dark red, golden retriever. Ollie lived a very long life, 15 and a half years. I grew up with him since second grade. He passed away peacefully this November, and we miss him dearly, terribly. At the time of the dream, he was quite an elderly dog, living a slower life. But when he was young, he loved to swim in the waves and romp on the beach. I dreamt that Ollie was near the harbor by our house and transformed into a blowfish. I came home and saw that my mom had fish in the kitchen. I realized the fish on the plate she was about to eat was in fact Ollie <laughs> and stopped her from eating him. Why go for a walk in Coney Island to look for narratives for American dreams? Sharon, the 17th dreamer, will tell us. Talking about Coney Island, People used to say, well, it's far away, and there's lots of crime there. But what I like about it is the boardwalk, and walking down the boardwalk near the ocean. And that we have such a festive atmosphere at times. It's sort of a carnival life. And I like that. I, I don't know why. It makes me feel happy or good. It's an entertainment place. In Delirium, New York, 
the architect Rem Colossus analyzed the morphology of Coney Island as a subconscious of the city of New York. What was this dreamland park? Requiem for a Dream, the Aronofsky's cinematographic mm -hmm. adaptation of Hubert Selby's novel, Last Exit to Brooklyn, was partly shot in Coney Island. In my project of gathering narratives of dreams in cities, I often meet a misunderstanding around this word, dream. Dreaming about America. Is it the American dream? No, of course not. Dreaming, in the sense that interests me the most, is one of the activities of human beings. It is not the contrary of action or opposite of action to dream. When you are dreaming that you have fear, you really do experience fear. Your fear is real. The object of your fear is not real. That does not mean that the object is not real. Dream prepares us to face some frightening experience. That's the meaning of Nightmare on Elm Street. Freddy is our guide, our Virgil, walking through the cities. In New York City, he has guided us in some neighborhood till the end of the queue line, on the boardwalk, among the Russian community, living in this kind of parallel world that consists of emigration. Parallel, that does not mean it's not a real world. Hearing the dreams of people who we meet allows us to hear their experiences of their reality which we are sharing in another perspective and in an oblique way. By conversing, we are arriving at the public library where we are meeting the 17th and the 18th dreamers. Coney Island Dreams, January 19, 2017. Coney Island branch of the Brooklyn Public Library. Sharon, 55 years old, began as a children's librarian and now serves as a supervisor to the librarian, like the assistant manager of the Coney Island branch. She was born in Mobile, Alabama, and raised in White Cross, Georgia. Her father was a musician, a jazz drummer. Her mother, a very beautiful, eccentric lady, started out being a magician's assistant getting sawed in half and having knives thrown at her. Sharon came to New York by the 1980s and has lived in Seagate, Coney Island since 1990. The last time I caught myself dreaming, it was probably about a month ago, I'm living in a house that has leaks all over the place. The ceiling has holes and it's leaking, the floor has holes and it's leaking. It always starts with the porch, the screened in porch and the living room and the kitchen, you know, the whole room arrangement. I have it memorized in this dream. There's this water all over the place and it's horrible, disgusting. I can't go to sleep. The leaks and water must be like crying and weeping, I don't know. So I go up the stairs and all of a sudden I hit this windy, white room and it has all windows around it and white curtains blowing and everything is white. And I feel very pure and safe all of a sudden. The bottom part of the house with the leaks reminds me of where I lived in White Cross, Georgia near Okfinoki Ok Swamp. That's where I'm from, south. Anyway, it reminds me of the house I lived from the edge of 7 to 14. I think some really bad things happened in this period, but I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> another night, I was looking for my dog on the beach in Coney Island after he ran away. He was a beagle and Lieutenant Colombo. He ran away in real life, but someone found him by the Dunkin' Donuts, recognized him, and brought him back. In the dream, he was going, and I was following him, 
and following him and I had him and I had him and then I lost him and I had him and I lost him. And the dream ended with me still looking for my dog. 18th dreamer, Carol, 63, born in Brooklyn, lived all around the borough, lived in bed Stuyvesant, among other neighborhoods, lives and works in Coney Island, the Brooklyn Public Library. Favorite place in Coney Island is the boardwalk. He dislikes when people congregate in Mermaid Avenue, beginning fights and congesting the street. I had one dream after I came home from work and I went to bed that Friday night a little while ago and I just lay down and play the guitar. We are both musicians, Carol and her colleague Sharon, the 17th Dreamer. But I wasn't thinking about that the whole week. I just lay down and I had a dream that a man gave me a guitar. And he handed me the guitar to me in my right hand, from his right hand to my right hand. And then I got up, got in my shower, had a cup of tea, continued to ponder about that dream. And I sat on the side of the couch, and I have some guitars in the natural room, because to me, dreams are rooms. Dreams are rooms from one level to the next, but they're just rules, because we are spiritual beings. We're spiritual beings first. So I looked at the case, and then I got up and I got dressed to go to my music teacher. She lives over there in Bedford Avenue, and I'm walking along Bedford Avenue, and so then I saw a house, and outside of the house they were giving away things, because it Turns out that the owners of the house were going to move. So I looked, and then the man said, Miss, if you like, you can take anything you want. So I began to think about what I'm going to take for people. And then the man comes out of the house from the back and said, Miss, would you like a guitar? <laughs> a nightmare I had was that there was a fire in the building and then because I have a connection to my mother mommy was already passed I saw her and she said stay stay don't come out of your apartment stay and then maybe six months later a fire happened and then the fire people told us to stay. They said, stay in the apartment. Stay in the apartment. And everybody wondering where and how it will all end, like in the movies or in some nightmare novel. Yes, it's in Nightmare. Yes. I said, yes, I will. And he, he called me his Andalusian Rose. He said, yes, my heart was going like mad. A Coney Island of the Mind. Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Nineteenth Dreamer. Rivka, Becky. Rivka is the Hebrew version of Rebecca. Twenty-three. Rivka was born in Brooklyn Bay Ridge and grew up in Coney Island. She lives at home in Coney Island and works in the Midtown Manhattan doing office administration, is looking for something she is more passionate about. Perhaps library and information science, or in the area of arts administration, working on a museum or a nonprofit organization. In college, she had a radio show. Native language, she's a heritage speaker of Russian, different than a native speaker, she learned it from her parents and not by growing up in Russia. She concurrently learned English as a child and is bilingual. She's now studying Yiddish. Rivka was not raised in a religious atmosphere. Her family emigrated from the former Soviet Union from Ukraine. Rivka. Religion was frowned on in general for the entire population. It was officially an atheist empire. They wouldn't say empire, but it was, I guess. And especially if you were Jewish, 
a lot of these customs were not passed on to later generations because it was a way of trying to survive. So I think my family lost a lot in that. So I'm not religious, uh, but I've always had a strong Jewish identity, especially because I'm from New York. So I've never really questioned it. There's a lot of Jewish culture here, written on our sweatshirt. I believe in alien, boardwalk in winter setting, dream about Coney Island, age, younger than 10. I think my most vivid dream came from when I was a kid. It wasn't boardwalk specific or beach specific, but it had to do with, I live pretty close to the Department of Motor Vehicles, and I had this weird dream. I mean, most dreams are weird. My brother was somehow a robot, like sort of silver, metallic, though I could recognize him in the dream. It was still his face. And somehow, the Department of Motor Vehicles was involved, and I could also recognize my building's lobby. That's the most vivid dream I can actually remember from when I was a kid. And I don't know the implications. No one does. Lighthouse Project and Rivka discussing the etymology of Kouchmar, comparing words in Russian and Yiddish. Another dream. I think I met an ex, ex-boyfriend's father, but I, I don't really remember the context around it. The next day, I was meeting a friend of mine. Maybe she knew the person I was dating. And I hadn't seen her in a long time, and maybe I was nervous about that. I've had dreams in the past where I've hurt someone's father who was abusing them. I feel like it was in a strip mall, or something like a cafe, or a bowling alley. And do you want to hear some news about your ex-boyfriend? No. The dream is news enough. Yes, that's the thing. They weren't in the dream, their father was. So, interesting. I think a lot of people in the Russian speaking immigrant community and children of those immigrants, they tend to be reactionary politically because it's a reaction against what they experienced under communism in the Soviet Union. They very much think that social welfare isn't good because it's something that comes from the government and it's being mistrustful of the government, something a lot of people experience. But the way they experience it in the US is they think that they didn't benefit from it. They say, let's help the government or get help from communities, help from different organizations when they did. No one succeeds alone. And the definition of success is very much relative. But it's this hypocrisy of like, why can't these people succeed? And it's always coded language against other demographics. And they don't realize, or they don't want to confront. It's like willful ignorance that the fabric of this country, the US, is built upon racism. And, and these things still affect people. Like Jim Crow wasn't that long ago and black people are incarcerated disproportionately still. And slavery is still legal in prisons. It's legal to not pay people to perform prison labor. And stuff like that. People don't want to confront that even when they themselves have experienced institutionalized discrimination and racism in their old countries. And the other thing, is that our political climate, there's a lot of Russophobia in the United States, and 
not, I guess, just in the United States, because of the Russia-US collusion in, in some ways, I think this is a deflecting tactic. I think, yes, there was involvement. I will say I'm not super well read on all that, but I do think that people don't want to confront problems domestically. Trump's election and the election of other politicians who are also super xenophobic and racist because of the problems at home, because of a culture of racism, because people don't want to confront that. They want to point to a scapegoat. And so I've seen, like at the Women's March a few days ago, people who aren't, like, I would say, super politically involved, maybe it was their first time marching. They had signs in Cyrillic that were bad translations. They were like, it harkens back to the Red Scare. They aren't being very critical, and I'm sure if they heard Russian speakers on the street, they would probably react badly. They're probably xenophobic and they don't realize it. It's just not cool. You shouldn't essentialize an entire population. Uh, they don't know the histories of those people. 20th Dreamer, Julia, age 29, works in cinema studies in Brooklyn College, author of a graphic novel, the Soviet Daughters. Born in Kiev, she emigrated to Chicago in 1992, went to college in New York 2006, also lived in Paris, went back to Manhattan, Boston, Cambridge, spent a summer in Japan, and then another half year in Paris and Brooklyn, and half a year in the Caribbean and then Brooklyn. Father's profession. I've never met my father. I have no idea. I don't have a strong feeling for him, by the way. I have been raised by my grandparents. So this is Julia, raised by her grandparents. They are a little more intellectual, but they're not super intellectual. My grandmother was a school teacher. My grandfather was an engineer. Very Russian. Mother's profession, an accountant. Living in Brooklyn Crown Heights. Working. Mother tongue. That's a hard question. My first language is Russian. But my native language is English now. So it's hard to say. Because now, I feel more comfortable in English, but my first language is not English. I speak Russian, French, Japanese. Religion, no. Atheist and anti-religious atmosphere. The culture is very secular. I was raised to be very suspicious towards religion. I do not celebrate anything religious. I do anything. We are Jewish, but are celebrating Christmas. Because in America, it is not a religion celebration. We give presents. You told me a dream that was in the Russian language. Uh, yeah, I was going to use that one, actually, but... Um, okay, this is a crazy dream. This is the cra one of the craziest dreams I've had in a long time. Because of last semester, I need some, con I need some context why I had such a strange dream. This last semester, I was teaching Russian cinema, and I was watching a lot of 1960s experimental and, and, and art films done by directors who were banned by the Soviets, like Tartovsky's and I Dream in the style of a 1960s Soviet film that was banned and then re-released in the 1980s. It was crazy. Like, the cinematography was so good. It was crazy. I actually dreamt, I wasn't in the dream, but I dreamt that I had just watched a film. I wasn't involved in the dream. You told us that in your dreams, you're usually outside your dream. No. It's still unusual. After having the dream, 
after waking, I told myself, I want to make this film because in the film, there is a father and he has three sons and they spoke Russian with a Ukrainian accent. And so there was a father and three sons and it was during the time of World War I, World War II, the beginning of World War II. So they might have been partisans, but they were not. And in the dream, the father, you know, the father is sort of uh, apolitical, like the elder and the middle son, kind of selfish. They're, they're not great people, and they want to help the Germans, because they think the Germans are going to make their lives better. We just have to help them, like, the Nazis probably win, so they have to help them. That was just what people thought. This was very common. In fact, right, the, the youngest is pure-hearted. He's a character folk actor. Uh, he is the purest, you know, the one who does not do that. But either way, it doesn't have that much power. So his older brothers are helping the Germans. But all of this is very, very hard to understand or glean because there actually are no Germans in the film. You just kind of have the sense that the Germans are coming. And then there's this long sequence where the father is teaching his sons how to make soup. So he's pouring the soup into these bowls and there's like this protracted shot of the soup as if it was Godard's shot of the coffee. And two or three things I know about it. You know what I'm talking about? Like, it's this very allegorical sequence of the soup. And somehow, in the scene of the soup, the viewer is supposed to understand that the older and the middle brothers are not good people, and that somehow in the way they make the soup. And so the soup, the way the youngest son pours the soup, in that he was very pure and good-hearted, as opposed to the other two boys. Suddenly there was an angel, and this is very strange. An angel in the dream? Two angels. There are angels in my dream, in a very classical... It's, it's strange, because I, I have no Christian anything. I'm not exposed to anything in Christianity. And so the angels were women. They looked almost like Tilda Swinson, the actual Tilda Swinson. <coughs> so the angels were these beautiful blonde women, with bowl haircut blonde women with these white robes and these giant white feathery wings, like classical, classical view of angel. Except women, usually angels are seen as males. So it's like this classical female angel, and the angel is talking to another angel, and she says, they're doing something terrible. They need to be punished. That's because they're helping the Germans. Now they need to be punished. So they're about to punish. It's unclear in the dream how they're punished, but I think they die. So they make it so the Germans destroy this house with the father and the two eldest sons. They wait there until the Germans come and they die, even though they want to help them. The Germans don't believe them. And so this was all planned by the angels because they were impure and they wanted to help them.